That was fun. Our scripture reading, there are two of them. The first is from Psalm 104. As Peter says, this may be the most detailed description of ecological relationships in the Bible. I'm going to read just verses 10 through 13 and 18 through 23, but go home this week sometime, pull out your Bibles, and read the whole chapter, which includes more really beautiful words. O oh God, you set springs gushing in ravines, running down between the mountains, supplying water for wild animals and attracting the thirsty wild donkeys. The birds of the air make their nests by these waters and sing among the branches. From your palace you water the highlands until the ground is sated by the fruit of your work. For the wild goats there are the high mountains and in the crags the badgers hide. You made the moon to tell the seasons, and the sun knows when to set. You bring darkness on, night falls, and all the forest animals come out, savage lions roaring for their prey, claiming their food from God. The sun rises, they retire, going back to lie down in their lairs, and people go out to work, to labor again until evening. Oh God, what variety you have created, arranging everything so wisely. The earth is filled with your creativity. And then the epistle from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The reason Christ died for all was so that the living should live no longer for themselves, but for Christ, who died and was raised to life for them. And so from now on, we don't look on anyone in terms of mere human judgment. Even if we did once regard Christ in these terms, that's not how we know Christ now. And for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old order has passed away. And now everything is new. All of this is from God who reconciled us through Christ and made us ministers of that reconciliation. This means that through Christ, the world was fully reconciled again to God, who didn't hold our transgressions against us, but instead entrusted us with this message of reconciliation. This makes us Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making the appeal directly through us. Therefore, we implore you in Christ's name, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made the one who was without sin to be sin, so that by this means we might become the very holiness of God. Forty nine years. The place <laughs> looks pretty much the same. Amazing. <laughs> All things are connected. I love telling that story because I get to do the frog sounds. Reading, reading. And because all things are connected is a perspective that goes to the very heart of our Christian faith. This morning, I come with good news about our relational world, a brief reminder of the bad news that those relationships have become thoroughly disrupted, and lots more good news about our calling to live rightly within that relational world. Now, half to two-thirds of what I'm going to say today is a message that I hope can be meaningful to almost anybody. The other half or two-thirds is going to be explicitly Christian and use a fair bit of God talk. In my home church, you have to give a warning about that. <laughs> and it's especially appropriate here at First Congregational as you work on the notion of that creation justice declaration, which is so important. It's important that we understand the rooting in our own faith tradition for that. The African story teaches about the connections between frogs, mosquitoes, and a livable village. There are similar stories and knowledge in many indigenous cultures 
which are richly connected with place and with ecology. They speak to us of a universal truth. All things are connected everywhere, everything. That's an old lesson that modern science is confirming. We live in an inherently relational universe. At every level, we find relationships. Atoms form molecules because of the relationship between subatomic particles. At the other extreme, massive galaxies are held together in spirals or globular clusters because of the relational pull of gravity. Without those forces holding things together, our universe could not exist. The science of chemistry details the molecular relationships and physics explores those other forces. We are finally learning that the delicate climate of our planet is shaped by relationships between sunlight and water vapor, clouds and greenhouse gases, snow and land and ocean currents. It is an incredibly complex interplay of factors, all in relationship with each other. In human communities, the sciences of sociology and economics explore some of our relationships, mediated through institutions like government, families, churches, schools, labor unions, and banks. The mysterious invisible hand of the marketplace that some like to talk about works so well because we are all related in connection with each other. And the decisions that we make about how to spend our money or use our time flow out and touch all those around us. The relatively new field of ecology, it was new when I studied it at CC 50 years ago, that field of ecology looks at the relationships that flow through the entire realm of life. The actions of predators clearly impact the life chances of their prey. The health of ecosystems influence all the diverse kinds of plants and animals that can live within a habitat. Species involve in intimate relationship with each other so that many plants require one very particular kind of bug or flower to be able to pollinate its flowers. Bug or bird, excuse me. Some of those relationships are very particular and all of them have broad consequences. An amazing and vivid example of complex ecological relationships comes from Yellowstone National Park. Some of you have probably been there in recent years. Wolves had been wiped out in Yellowstone in the early 20th century, and they were reintroduced in 1995. The most immediate effect of the parks was on the park's dramatically overpopulated elk herds. The wolves fairly quickly brought those back into balance. But in one shorthand thing I said, the other dramatic effect of the wolves at Yellowstone was there was a proliferation of songbirds. Why is that? One report puts it this way. Since wild wolves have returned to Yellowstone, the elk and deer are stronger, the aspens and willows are healthier, and the grass is taller. For example, when wolves chase elk during the hunt, the elk are forced to run faster and farther. As the elk run, their hooves aerate the soil, allowing more grasses to grow. Since the elk cannot remain stationary for too long, aspen and willows are not heavily grazed and therefore can recover between migrations thus the songbirds. Coyotes have been outcompeted, and with fewer coyotes hunting small rodents, raptors like eagle and osprey have more prey and are making a comeback. A wild wolf population actually makes for a stronger, healthier, and more balanced ecosystem. Yes, all things are connected. And that's why a few years ago, Colorado voted to reintroduce wolves in our state. But the balancing effect's not gonna be quite as profound outside of a pristine national park setting, so don't hold your breath too much. 
Science reveals the web of relationships that are built into the structure of the whole universe and that form the basis of all life. But the pervasive relationships of the world are not a new discovery. They've always been evident to those who pay attention. Psalm 104 is a marvelous hymn celebrating the God of creation. This morning we heard the central part of it, which reads like a textbook description from an environmental biology course. Praise is offered to God because life flourishes in the context of ecological niches and healthy habitats. The psalmist knew that water and rocks, trees and grasses determine what can live where. The high mountain rocks are a different habitat than the verdant streamside. Some animals are active during the day, others at night. And I want to point out that as this psalm describes it, humans do not have any special role of dominion or stewardship over creation. Humans simply do our work during the day and the lions do theirs at night. All of creation depends on the abundance of God, not our management. What a marvelous world, what a marvelous universe, all held together by a web of relationships that is far beyond our understanding or our control. But really, what else would we expect from our God who seems to cherish relationships? God is love is the concise proclamation of the first letter of John. The primary quality of God is to be in relationship. So it is not at all surprising that God's universe depends on all things being in right relationship. All things are connected, not by accident or incidentally. That's the way the universe works. No one no thing exists outside of those relationships. We are all tied to God, to each other, and to the whole created order. Thanks be to God. But, but, within that whole vast interconnected wonder of God's creation, our human species does seem to have a unique gift. Our kind appears to be the only part of God's creation with a propensity or even a desire to distort and break down the web of interconnections that surrounds us. There are many terms for broken relationships, injustice, oppression, alienation, pollution, extinction, devastation, in broad theological language, those broken relationships are called sin and evil, and we excel at it. We've shattered and mangled our relationships with God, and we've done the same with our communities and with all of our far-flung neighbors, neighbors, humans, and the rest of creation. Sin in our personal lives and in our broader human society is a central theme for the Christian church. The presence of sin and injustice in all of our stressed and broken relationships goes to the very heart of our faith and our gospel. Classical theology tells us that the saving work of God in Christ is necessary because sin and evil are pervasive in the world. As I have grown into an ecological understanding of the Christian faith, my sense of sin includes the fracture that has developed between humans and the rest of creation. In our modern technological and business-oriented world, we look at the world very differently than the joyous description that we saw in Psalm 104. Rather than seeing a world filled with life and relationship in which all things praise God, we have tended, broadly speaking, to see the world as a collection of things. We see it as stuff that exists in isolation. We see resources sitting there just waiting to be used. Sometimes we think of some of those things as 
pests, perhaps frogs or mosquitoes, plants or bugs or germs or maybe even other people get in our way. And with a mindset of alienation and isolation, we then try to exterminate the pests. In sin, we place ourselves at the center and we are blind to the relationships around us. If sin is the presence of broken and distorted relationships, then humans have sinned deeply against God and creation. In the words of one fairly, words of one fairly recent theological document, we have become uncreators. Over and over again, our Christian faith and our modern society have ignored the web of relationships that support and sustain the natural world. We have thought and acted as if we are separate from the natural world. We have imagined that we can chew up nature without causing impacts that spread far and wide in the web of life. The ecological and social justice crises around us, though, tell us that we are wrong. Within our faith tradition, there are many ways of understanding humanity's relationship with the whole web of life. One tells us that humans have dominion over all things. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Think of that. We're not only separate from the web of life, but we get to control it all. I, I would point out, though, that the word dominion is used in that sense of humans over nature twice in the entire Bible. It is found at the end of Genesis 1, which we often hear quoted, and it is found in Psalm 8. And that's it. Two references, but because it puts us in control, it's become our favorite definition. How convenient. A slightly better tradition calls us to be good stewards of God's creation. We heard that in the opening hymn today. But that still places us outside of the ecological realm, and it still places us in control. Over the last 15 years or so, I've been, advo been an advocate for a new understanding of the proper role of humans within a relational world. I think that we are called to be responsible members of earth community. Responsible members, not outside, not controlling, but being responsible within the relationships that exist. That understanding of humanity's role is compatible with our faith tradition, and it is an understanding that can be claimed by all people around us. That new ecological understanding is part of my good news for this morning. But another part of the good news has to do with Christian theology. Caring for creation is not a sidebar to our faith. It is a part of the basic proclamation of the Christian gospel when we listen openly enough. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, a church, by the way, that knew more than its fair share of turmoil and disruption and conflict. Paul told them that in Christ, God was reconciling the world's world to God's self, not counting their trespasses against them. Reconciling. What a powerful word. In Christ, God repairs and restores broken relationships. God reaches out to reconcile us with God's self, forgiving the trespasses, offering a fresh start. So, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. That forgiveness, that grace, that reconciliation is the distinctive message of the Christian faith. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self. But did you catch the surprising word in there? In Christ, God was reconciling the world. Not us Christians, not us people, the world. 
The Greek word is cosmos, the whole creation. All of those diverse, broken relationships are part of God's reconciliation. Yes, the gospel is about our personal relationship with God. And it is about our social sin and evil among our human sisters and brothers. And the gospel also is about the healing of ecological sin with all of our neighbors through the whole web of life. In Christ, God was reconciling the world, restoring all the broken relationships and the distorted relationships. Thanks be to God. But you know, there's one last little zinger in that short paragraph from Paul. God was in Christ, reconciling the world, and Paul says, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for God, since God is making this appeal through us. It is not enough for us to receive the message of reconciliation. We are to be agents of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ. We are to be doing the work of healing and restoring broken relationships, reaching out into all of the world, into all of the creation, embodying and expressing and proclaiming the good news of reconciliation. We, who are new creations through the gift of reconciliation, are giving them, given the ministry of taking that gift into all of the world. We are to be about the godly work of healing and restoring broken relationships wherever they are found. We are to go about the ministry of reconciliation in personal relationships, in social justice, and in ecological healing. We are called to that ministry of reconciliation in a world that is inherently relational. From the tiniest atom to the farthest galaxy, all things are connected. Restoring wolves to Yellowstone and to Colorado is an act of reconciliation. God has entrusted that message of reconciliation to us. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, a ministry that calls us to reach out into all parts of the earth community, into all parts of creation. That ministry of reconciliation stands in direct contrast with the way of exploitation and abuse, which are so deeply embedded in modern society. We have a countercultural task. An African folktale, an ancient biblical song, and the discoveries of modern science all tell us the same thing. All things are connected. The universe is filled with relationship, and many of those relationships have been broken by human sin. That sin is the source of what we call the environmental crisis. The Christian gospel is about the forgiveness of sin. It is about reconciliation in the midst of broken relationships. That good news is a gift of grace from the God that we know as love the God who calls us towards peace and justice in all relationships. God calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, agents of healing to all broken relationships. Today and every day, may we go about that blessed ministry with joy. <laughs>